Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. We're really excited to have Jeff Merritt here with us. Um, this, for those of you who don't know, um, is the studio where the MFA program for interaction design lives at the School of Visual Arts. Um, we invited Jeff here tonight because we think a lot about what the future looks like and we uh, view the program as part of New York City and New York City is part of this program. So it was really exciting to have the Director of Innovation for the Mayor's Office come and talk to us about how he thinks uh, technology will shape the future of our city and how he thinks about rolling out new tech in, in the city. <laughs> All right. Um. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here and all coming out on a uh, midday uh, week evening. And uh, this actually was like an easy decision when I get these invites. If, if I'm invited out to talk to a bunch of designers, that's probably like my favorite place to be because uh, I feel like designers, uh, in some ways I connect with uh, folks like you because you tend to be very entrepreneurial and always thinking about like how can we change things to make it better. And if there's one thing that is my job in the city it is to make not only sort of uh, people's lives easier that work for the city of New York, but also just for residents generally. And uh, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about sort of how we're thinking about sort of designing for the future, right? And uh, I'm going to walk through a, a case study. And I think you'll see a lot of sort of elements of design here. I think of design in a very broad sense. Uh, I feel like in many ways when public, the public thinks about designer, they think in very like narrow terms, like designers make things pretty. Um, but designers really, good design is about a vision, right? And it's about sort of thinking through a full strategy for rolling something out that's really impactful in a lot of different ways. And so um, I think it, you'll see in this sort of uh, case study, they walk through a lot of different elements of design and some takeaways here. So I'm going to sort of focus on five takeaways. I'm going to try not to talk for too much here, so we have a lot of time for interactive discussion then afterwards. So um, building for the future, I think the starting point here is that we have to recognize the sort of era, the time in which we live now, um, is an era in which things are moving at a ridiculously fast pace, right? that in most cases, when you guys go out to buy that new iPhone 8 or iPhone 10 or whatever, by the time you bought it, the reality is it's already outdated because they're, they've been working on the next version, right? And that that's the case in almost everything out there, that, that there are so many folks working on constantly reinvent, reinventing everything around us that we're always a little bit behind. And so how do you, as a designer, you know, how, or even as a city planner or someone thinking about the future, how do we deal with that reality that we can't really plan too far in the advance, too far advance into the future? And I think it's important to recognize that even if you don't think about yourself as a technologist, even if you don't think about technology as a core piece of everything you do, the reality is that in some ways you don't have a choice um, soon enough, it will be a key part of everything that you do. Um, there's a bunch of charts here on this right-hand side that basically are all sloping fast down. And what those all are are the cost of technology. Computing costs, storage costs, connectivity costs are all plummeting rapidly. And what that means is that now the actual additional cost to put a computer chip and to make that connected into anything is so low that it's almost a no-brainer that increasingly, you know, you, you want to buy a chair, why not put a computer chip in that chair that will be able to sort of measure, um, you know, and tell you before that chair breaks, right? It becomes a no-brainer to just start putting technology in everything because the prices have dropped so low and the actual pieces of technology have gotten so small. So it doesn't really matter if you're, you know, designing buildings, if you're designing bridges, if you're designing chairs, if you're designing clocks, the odds are, you know, as we go more and more into the future, it's going to be very difficult to buy things that don't have technology in them. So the case study that I'm going to walk through uh, is the pay phones and sort of the, the reinvention here as a piece of, uh, you could probably say, I mean, it's sort of a piece of technology, right? It's a piece of infrastructure, um, something that when I first came to, to New York, I came to New York for, for grad school uh, in 2000, and the 
payphone was so critical to my life. Like when I came and I needed to uh, find my first apartment here, like you, I, I, being very literal here, you went over to the headquarters, to the Village Voice office over near Astor Place. You got the magazine, you know, the, the Village Voice right when they put out the print edition. You looked it up and you had to run to the nearest payphone and call to try and get um, one of those, the sort of listing folks to actually meet with you and, let, and show you that apartment. Like, we relied on payphones. That was 2000. That was not that long ago, right? That was 17 years. Um, and so when payphones came out, they were, and, you know, they were critical um, to the lives of New Yorkers. But again, the rapid pace of technology, you know, the, as soon as cell phones started to come out and became ubiquitous, these became antiquated and very quickly not only were they not valuable but they became something that was an eyesore and that really you know made that we were not only did people want to get rid of them but we were embarrassed of these you know essential critical piece of infrastructure so the technology became antiquated and wasn't really used uh, we had thousands we still have thousands of locations across the city and oftentimes they were in these big blocks that you guys see, right, taking up sidewalk space. Um, small businesses, residents hated them. They were perceived as an eyesore. Uh, more often than not, they were used for negative purposes as opposed to positive, right, that, uh, you know, criminals who didn't want to have a, a cell phone would use a pay phone or, you know, you'd, someone would go in to pee or something like that. Um, and so they were really disgusting. And, uh, and beyond that, the advertising that was on there it was, is largely unoriginal and uninspired because the reality of print advertising is you have to buy it in such bulk that folks aren't really thinking about, you know, what is the message for a particular area or audience. They're just blanketing it across the city. So what do you do when you have something like this that at one point is incredibly valuable and then all of a sudden um, is kind of useless in a way? Um, you re-envision it. Oops, 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 there we go. You re-envision it. Um, so what you're seeing now taking the place of pain phones are these structures here called Link NYC. Um, it's the world's largest, fastest municipal Wi-Fi network. They have free phone calls. You don't have to put quarters in or anything like that. They provide wayfinding, charging for your, um, for your cell phones. They actually have a much smaller um, footprint on sidewalks. They're only 11 inches uh, wide. There's fewer ads because instead of having ads on the side and these big ads on the side, you just have two um, screens on, on each side. They don't cost taxpayers a single penny. In fact, they actually generate $500 million in guaranteed revenue to the city that can go into schools and all the day-to-day -day operations of the city. On the advertising side, instead of just having blanketed, you know, generic ads, they enable hyper-local ads so that you know, a mom and pop shop here can actually run that at, you know, at the link at the end of the block and they can be time sensitive and day sensitive so they can, you know, at, at five o'clock advertise a, a happy hour that they're having. Um, again, more relevant, contextual, uh, contextually relevant ads uh, and also PSA. So you think in the case of the emergencies that we've seen, the hurricanes um, in the last few weeks, um, this is a huge asset for the city and the ability to actually push out specific information in different locations and say who's in an evacuation zone or to push out emergency information. Uh, and then obviously, you know, this is something that um, is made in New York by New York companies, by New Yorkers. It leads to job creation. There's required sort of maintenance and cleaning and there's mandatory technology refreshes. I'll get a little more into these. But, ha but in a period of a very short period of a couple of years, we have turned something that was seen as an eyesore and people hated and something that uh, the approval ratings on these things are over 90%, um, which I don't think Apple Pie has approval ratings over 90%, right? So especially something that government is involved in rarely has high approval ratings. So, so how did it happen? What do, what do I think are some of the sort of key takeaways? And, and I was fortunate, right, to, to be involved in this, in this you know, launch of this and the creation of this, I was in the right place at the right time. We had a really great uh, team, both from the public and private side. So the first takeaway is, I think, you know, about crowdsourcing ideation and the sort of wisdom of the crowd. 
This was not something that a bunch of bureaucrats sat in an office and came up with. Surprise, surprise, right? Um, actually, the thing that government would have come up with is more um, what, what the city tried out in, in 2012 as a sort of proof of concept. What if we actually just put a router on the top of the existing um, pay phones? Will people actually use it? Yes, people actually used it. Um, it provided a little more value, um, but it didn't actually sort of, it wasn't a game changer, right? And so. Um, thankfully, what the city decided to do, instead of trying to guess what the best thing um, would be and, and try and come up a vision, with a vision on their own, was to crowdsource that and do a design competition. And so designers from around the city came out. Um, this was at the end of 2012 and the beginning of 2013 as part of a design competition. The award for this, this design competition, if you won, was a certificate from the mayor. That was it. Um, it wasn't some grand prize. It wasn't a promise that your solution would be implemented. But people got involved because they were excited about the idea of sort of re-envisioning the streetscape of New York and, and taking something again that was a negative and turning it into a positive. And so all these different sort of ideas uh, came from that that ultimately provided the vision of what Link NYC is today. Takeaway two, um, again, thankfully, what we did as, as a city is we didn't go and just sort of say, okay, here's this design that came out of a design competition. Now let's release a solicitation and who can build that for the cheapest price. Instead, what we did is we did a very open-ended sort of call. And we said, we had this design competition. There were a lot of great ideas that came out of it. Here you can see some of those different things. Some people suggested you know, charging stations. Some people suggested a place to sit, all of these ideas. So take a look at those different ideas. Use that as inspiration. Um, and here's a couple of very basic requirements in terms of the size and things like that. And we said that they had to have Wi-Fi. That's all that we said. We didn't say anything about the speed or anything like that. And I took this from um, the proposal uh, that was submitted for the winning team, and you'll see why in a second. And you know, they uh, put here their commitment, right, to bring New Yorkers the highest or the the fastest public Wi-Fi that was available. And they they benchmarked over here. Here's you know Verizon FiOS here at about 100 megabytes per second. The average Wi-Fi in New York about 20 megabytes per second. Time Warner are coming up at about 28 megabytes per second. And this is just this was a print document that they delivered to us. Here's page one. Here's page two. <laughs> and there's page three. And so over, it took them three pages to actually show the speed uh, because, again, you're going 20 times faster than the average Wi Fi. The average Wi Fi being about uh, 20 megabytes per second um, and going up to 1,000 megabytes. Sorry, 50 times. Um, and again, is this something that the city of New York would have ever put out there? No, we didn't even think that was possible. I don't think most people thought it was possible. And it speaks to the power of competition here. And that I think a lot of times our impulse is to spell out all of the details, right? And that'll just make everything easier. Um, but we really have to harness the unknown and, and take advantage of the fact that people will put forward their best ideas um, when they want to win something. And that's definitely what happened here. Takeaway three is about cross-sector partnerships. And I know you guys hear this all the time about cross-disciplinary collaboration. But again, this is something that we wouldn't have these structures today if it wasn't for the team that came together. And so what happened is when the city had that design competition back in, in 2013, two different companies decided, they actually met each other at one of the sort of information sessions, and they decided to go in and collaborate together to put together an idea. And those two companies were an out-of-home advertising company called Titan that was based in New York, uh, and a small startup that did digital user experience tools called Control Group. They put together a proposal. Um, you know, it was, it was a fun thing that the staff was really excited about. Fast forward to this sort of the solicitation coming out from the city, they decided to put together that formal plan and they brought in additional partners. And so we as a city encourage partnerships here because we knew that when you're developing a piece of technology like this, it's not only about having, you know, the the people that understand internet connectivity. It's about having a team that 
understand sort of beautiful construction, right? And how do you build something that is durable? And so in that case, there was an industrial design firm called Comark that had done a lot of military applications and things like that. They actually are the ones that build those uh, the MTA terminals you use to pay for your tickets, your metro cards, and things like that. But they're good at building like indestructible things. Uh, and then they brought on a New York City design firm called Antenna Design that just is great at putting together beautiful things that are sleek um, and can stand the test of time from a design aesthetic standpoint. They brought in Qualmark, which is one of the sort of leaders in uh, connectivity. So they make the bits that are, you know, the, the actual sort of processors that are in your phone that enable it to connect uh, to the internet and such. And then it was, it was Titan and Control Group. And, and Control Group, again, brought in that sort of design from a digital, the digital design and user experience comp component, and Titan specialized in selling out-of-home advertising. And so all of those elements sort of fit together here. And not only did they have the right people at the table to put through a sort of comprehensive idea and plan that could be implemented, but they're incentivized to be best in class. Right, that the design team that did the aesthetics here wanted something that they could submit for awards and be really proud of. The connectivity team wanted to make sure this was always the world's, you know, or is always the world's fastest connection system. The advertising folks wanted, are trying to reinvent the way that we do out of home advertising in the same way that Google or Facebook have transformed advertising online, and then the same thing with user experience. They wanted to change the way in which people interact with technology in public spaces. Takeaway four, um, simplicity. Uh, these again are from that original proposal. And what's interesting here is that links are a new piece of technology. Um, when they put these designs together, this didn't exist. No one had made a, I, I remember reading one of the um, articles and they described it as like a giant iPhone. No one had ever made a giant iPhone and, and put it out on, on streets uh, in the world. And what I think is beautiful about this is that at the end of the day, it's a living room in a box. And what I mean by that is it's two flat screen TVs. It is a router like you have at home to connect to the internet. Uh, it's an Android tablet there. You know, it's a battery and power source, uh, but that's it. Um, it is not anything at the end of that that is revolutionary. It's just that they're putting them together for the first time in a public space. And what's really valuable about that is that it's modular in, in construction. And what that means is that, you know, if you go back to what I was saying earlier, by the time, even though this was rolled out in a very rapid time frame, uh, we decided, we sort of selected the winner in December of 2014. In 2015, they did product development testing. And in the beginning of 2016, in January 26, we had the first ones going in the ground. So very rapid period of time. But even during that period of time, these particular elements, some of them became outdated, right? That there's new, great, better TV screens and that kind of thing. But because it's modular, it means that you can actually swap things out. Uh, and they're, again, they're incentivized to do that as part of their contract, in fact, because they want to make sure that they don't just have old technology out there. So there's Android tablets here. If a couple years from now, Android tablets are not the best way um, for you to sort of interface, you can just pull that out and put another piece of technology in there, right? So it's simple in its design. It's modular. It's not trying to sort of reinvent the wheel. It's just trying to sort of provide a new way to use things and present um, sort of tried and tested technologies um, in a new space. And the last takeaway here, um, obviously I've been saying a lot of like great things about this. It's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's a product that I'm very proud of and I think New Yorkers should be proud of. That doesn't mean that it was an easy rollout by any means. Uh, if you saw any of the, the news about Lake NYC in the last you know, year, it was very, very critical. Um, and that's partly because uh, it ta anytime you're introducing anything new onto the market and you're trying to do something different, there's a lot of public education that has to happen. And so this first one from the Village Voice was, um, you can see Google Alert, the company's Trojan horse, <coughs> Wi-Fi kiosks scare even the people who built them, who invited them in again. And this was, uh, this sort of grew out of a, a story that happened where 
Um, those two companies I mentioned early on, Titan and Control Group, ended up merging um, and becoming a new company called Intersection. One of the Google Alphabet companies called Sidewalk Labs decided to invest in that company, um, and that very quickly became a, a news story. The reality was that Intersection was a minority sort of um, part of the bigger group behind Link, and that Sidewalk Labs was a minority shareholder of that minority group. So it had a very little role and no influence in all of this or any access to the data, but nonetheless um, created some, some big concerns. And then um, on the right-hand side here, uh, an issue that became prevalent anytime you're giving away sort of free, you know, part of the goal and the vision with Link NYC was to ensure free high-speed internet to all New Yorkers, right? And recognizing that New York, that I think it's 600,000 New Yorkers don't have internet access at home, um, and therefore are very reliant on their cell phones and those data plans. And so if they're able to go out in a public space and, and not have to pay for their data, kids are able to do their homework better. Or someone, um, take somebody who's homeless, right, who is completely disconnected out of the world and now has a connection into the world again, right? Um, and very quickly that became an issue that homeless people using, uh, using Link NYC and also folks sort of working around the, the various filters and looking at obscene things on the, on the tablets. And so ultimately we had to pivot, like anything, pivot and um, in that case take down the sort of ability to look at, uh, to use the browser on those tablets. So, you know, it wasn't a coincidence that we launched this with big beta, with a big beta sticker up on the top, top and we continue to sort of iterate as we go. Uh, but I think, again, it's just, a, it's a, in some ways, I think this is a badge of honor that if you do something that is truly breakthrough and innovative, you should have some pushback. You should stir things up a little. Um, and now, again, I, you know, that we have really strong um, support for Link. It's very widely used. They have over a million users. Um, that are sort of registered through the system and it's growing very rapidly. Uh, so I'll end with that. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, as you walk around the city, you'll see a lot of things that need to be sort of re-envisioned and reinvented. And, and some of them, you know, might have a clear sort of path forward. Others may not. Um, you know, you look at something like our post office boxes, there's over 20,000 of them. Uh, that are around the city, they were built for a different era. They were built for an era where people sent letters. Um, we live in a time where the majority of things that you receive in the mail are actually packages. Um, and the fact that a large number of New Yorkers, particularly those who live in the outer boroughs, don't have doormen and can't receive packages means that we have inequities that are created as a result of a postal system that is geared towards letter delivery, not packages, so that a lot of New Yorkers can't get, you know, you know, Amazon Prime things delivered or food delivered as, as easy as other New Yorkers. You know, or something like emergency call boxes, 20,000 of these around the city. Again, it's an asset. Um, it can evolve potentially for, for a new era, but we really want to think about that carefully. How do we, how do we leverage that real estate? Um, what are the, the new needs that we have today? What are the needs that we will have in the future? Uh, and that's, I think, um, that's the exciting thing about the world that we live in today. Yes, we have incredible technological change and things are moving fast, but that's an opportunity. Um, and I think all of you, luckily because of the sort of career path that you've taken, have the opportunity to be part of that.